endocrine system. All right, I'm on slide number two. And at the top is just a, a reminder that there's a difference between, well, there are actually many differences, between exocrine glands and endocrine glands. The chief differences are that exocrine glands will typically have a duct, the only exception being unicellular exocrine glands, and our go-to example of that is, is the goblet cell, uh, whereas endocrine glands do not have ducting. They're entirely secretory in it, and just in case that, that's a new term, new, new term for you, secretory unit. Any gland will have a, a secretory unit. It's just a question of whether there's also ducting leading from that secretory unit. Uh, and then also, by definition, endocrine glands secrete their products into the bloodstream, and their products are called hormones. Okay? And that, that's actually what a hormone is. It's, it's a cellular signal that is specifically delivered via the bloodstream, okay? And I'm sure I'll say that many, many times to come. All endocrine glands are multicellular. It's only exocrine glands that may be unicellular, although most exocrine glands are multicellular. And we have oodles and oodles and oodles of um, secretory glands, okay, multicellular glands. We certainly use them to coordinate our cellular activities, and we'll come back to that. I'm on slide number three. Slide number three is an overview of at least many of the different mechanisms that we use to allow cells to communicate with each other, okay? And you may recall from 241, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, really all animal cells have specialized intercellular junctions, gap junctions, desmosomes, tight junctions. Well, gap junctions are very pore-like or channel-like, and uh, they allow cells to very easily, at least adjacent cells, very easily uh, share cellular signals, cellular messages, okay? Uh, even when cells don't, feature gap junctions or they don't feature a lot of gap junctions just being near each other um, and and the near each other the more um, stuck to each other the better hence the note here about cell adhesion proteins proteins that just help cells to adhere to each other stick to each other uh, will facilitate communication between those cells when a cell is releasing a product that then influences itself, then that cellular signal is called an autocrine. An autocrine, okay? And auto means self, which is nice. Okay, if a cell is secreting a signal that influences other, usually nearby cells, um, and that cell signal that's being released, which is typically a protein, uh, what isn't a protein, most things are proteins, um, that's a paracrine, a paracrine, okay, and um, this is going to be non-self but nearby, so nearby that the bloodstream is not necessary, we don't, we don't need the blood mobile, okay. So I guess I'll write not blood, okay? Whereas if we need to communicate from one organ to another or from one region of the body to another, that's a longer distance uh, phone call. And we achieve that cell-to-cell -cell communication via both the nervous system, although um, you can think of neurotransmitters at least from, from one neuron to the next, so from presynaptic to postsynaptic, as a paracrine, okay? Um, but certainly the linkage of neurons allows us to communicate long distance and via hormones. And again, the, the, the take-home message with hormones, what makes them different than autocrines or paracrines or um, 
cell signals that travel via gap junctions, for instance, is that hormones mm -hmm. are cell signals that travel via the bloodstream, okay? Now, you may already know that some chemicals that act as neurotransmitters can also act as hormones. For instance, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine can act as nor neurotransmitters. They can act as hormones. So how do I know whether such a, a molecule is acting as a neurotransmitter or a hormone? Again, bloodstream. If it enters the bloodstream, it's a hormone. If it doesn't enter the bloodstream, it's not a hormone. <laughs> okay, very straightforward. Let's move on to slide number four. And slide number four is a little bit uh, risky. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little fence for us here because uh, we do want these the, these two lists near each other, but we don't want to confuse them with each other, which is a very common um, mistake. Okay. First, let's talk about the different processes that are influenced by the endocrine system, the different processes that are influenced by hormones. Reproduction. Yes, um, we can be talking about the brown chick or brown cow. Um, actually having intercourse we could be talk talking about uh being uh primed to have intercourse so in other words uh having gametes ready or um being hormonally ready to for instance uh um receive an embryo that sort of thing okay growth is actually a type of of reproduction right just uh reproduction via mitosis right no meiosis necessary development uh think about think about embryology whenever you think about development okay um but uh especially where hormones are concerned, there's another period in our lifetime where we undergo some really drastic changes, some developmental changes, and that's typically during adolescence. Okay, osmoregulation is influenced by hormones. In fact, many different hormones have uh, some impact, although it may not be direct, on osmoregulation. And osmoregulation, just in case you need a reminder, is the idea of balance between solvent, typically water, and solute. Okay. Uh, metabolism, how uh, we spend energy, what we spend energy on, uh, sort of influencing our energy budget then and also mobilizing our immune defenses, uh, organizing our immune defenses. So in, in that sense, immune system and endocrine system have an overlap, which is really not, not uncommon at all with organ systems that they will have overlapping um, functions or um, overlapping mechanisms, okay? So that's a list of the processes influenced by the endocrine system, whereas on the bottom half of this same slide is another list. Yay! <laughs> this is a list of the, the different um, ways in which the endocrine system can alter cell activity. So uh, this is more of a, of a how. How are those processes influenced, okay? And a lot of students make the mistake of, of concluding that this is a list of five mechanisms because they just count bullets. Personally, I can, I can tease out of this, this slide five different mechanisms or ways in which the endocrine system can alter the activity of target cells. Open ion channels, trigger the opening of ion channels, trigger the closing of ion channels, stimulate the synthesis or production of proteins, and you can hopefully infer, inhibit <laughs> the synthesis of proteins, activate, turn on, um, make viable enzymes, deactivate 
uh, render dormant, if you will, enzymes. Increase induce secretory activity, in other words, um, trigger the secretion of you know, often another hormone, okay? And hopefully you can infer, uh, reduce the, the secretion of a product, okay? So inhibit, um, oh my gosh, I just totally blanked on the opposite of inhibit. Inhibitory. Stimulatory, there I'm good. Uh, stimulate, inhibit, it, secretory activity, good grief. Uh, and then stimulate mitosis, uh, stimulate the, the copying of cells, and you can hopefully infer, inhibit mitosis. So I can actually get, get 10 different mechanisms off of that list. So be careful again. Um, if I were asking for this in, a, in, a, in an assessment, I would be careful to use the word process or processes. Um, I would be careful to use terms like how or um, cell activity or alter or mechanism, okay? Anywho, let's move to slide number five, which is a little messy once, once it's downloaded in this app, but it's cleaner, of course, in the original PowerPoint, which you have access to on Canvas. Hormones have target cells and hopefully that's that's not at all surprising hopefully you already know that our cells wear lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of receptors cellular receptors not sensory receptors and each uh, different type of receptor is very uh, neatly fitted to typically just one type of key so in that sense a cellular receptor is kind of like a lock and hormones are the keys for many but obviously not all of the receptors that our cells feature okay because we make different types of hormones that are essentially different different chemicals different molecules not every hormone will unlock or fit into every cellular receptor therefore even though sure our hormones may be circulating throughout the body via the bloodstream they're only going to influence the cells that have the matchy matchy cellular receptors for them and that's why we often use the phrase target or target cells or target organ when we're discussing the endocrine system because uh if it if it doesn't have the matchy matchy receptors then it can't act as that hormone's target okay we will go into far more detail than you would probably even like um, for each of the, the chief endocrine organs. Uh, so this is just an overview, but one thing you want to keep in mind and one thing that will probably tick you off in the end is that really most of our organs have some cells that act as endocrine cells, some cells that secrete chemical messengers into the bloodstream, okay? So this list, these are just the heavy hitters. Uh, these are um, organs that are either dedicated or committed to the endocrine system. Uh, they, they only or chiefly belong to the endocrine system or they're organs that have really important roles to play. Okay, and the numbers here, you might be able to infer what they mean. Uh, this is the number of copies that we would expect to find in a normal human body. So, uh, endocrine glands, most of these are referred to as glands. We have a pituitary gland. We just have one pituitary gland. It does have two regions or lobes, an anterior lobe and a posterior lobe, but they're parts of the same single gland. The pituitary gland is in the brain, and really in this image you can't quite make it out, or, or if you know where to find it, maybe you can, you can make it out. I'm going to just mark it. Boop. I don't even know if you can see the little dot that I just made. The thyroid gland. We only have one. It's in the neck, and it's this guy that looks kind of like a bow tie or a butterfly. Just one, but also two lobes, okay? 
we have parathyroid glands. And parathyroid glands are kind of interesting because not everybody has the same number of parathyroid glands. Most people have four, but some people have five, some people have six, some people have seven, some people have eight, and that's totally okay. So that's why the slide says four-ish. And the parathyroid glands are actually sitting on the posterior of the thyroid gland. So this particular image is a little misleading. You'd have to use your x-ray, x-ray vision to see these fairly small glands sitting on the back of the thyroid gland. The adrenal glands, one on top of each kidney, kind of like a thimble or a little hat for our kidneys. Okay, so two of those total. Pineal gland is in the brain, and I'm not sure that you can make it out, but it's right beep, there. Don't worry, we'll zoom in on all of this later. We don't have one pineal gland. We also have just one hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, some of my students will think of as the bird beak. It's here, also in the brain, just one. Uh, the pancreas. The pancreas sits inferior and posterior to the stomach. So if we were dissecting, we'd have to lift the stomach up out of the way in order to see the pancreas. And texturally, I find the pancreas to look a heck of a lot like ground turkey meat, like alarmingly so. Okay, it looks a bit like a fish, and, and um, some people think it looks like a tadpole, and, and in fact, it has a tail and a head because of that. Just one pancreas, two gonads, and um, people tend to know what gonads are if they're familiar with the term, but not everybody's familiar with the term. Gonads are the, the sex organs, if you will. They have two major functions to produce, obviously, sex hormones, but also to produce gametes. And the gametes, just in case you need a, a reminder there, are ova, which is the fancy pants word for eggs. A single egg is an ovum, and sperm, okay? Uh, two gonads per body. The placenta, believe it or not, is considered an endocrine organ. It's just a weirdo because it's a temporary endocrine organ. The thymus, the thymus is here. It's this guy in the chest. It's sitting on top of the heart and, and on top of the, the pericardium. So it's, it's in the mediastinum, okay? And actually, if this gentleman were uh, as advanced in years as he appears, uh, it really wouldn't look as neat as it does in this image. It would be difficult to find during dissection, in fact, because it actually atrophies with age. But we'll come back to that. Just one thymus. The kidneys, in addition to their other functions, they do have important endocrine function. We have two kidneys, okay? And heart, believe it or not, does have important endocrine functions to play, which is uh, probably surprising. All right, let's move on to slide number six. And in fact, most of the, the uh, slides that, that we'll see in this first um, file will be, <coughs> excuse me, very general slides, just to get the, the ideas of how hormones work um, and really what hormones are, okay, before we actually start meeting specific hormones or specific organs, okay? Well, um, we can actually classify hormones because they're chemicals via a, a number of different different schemes. But in this class, I think it's most valuable for us to, to classify them um, in accordance with where they bind to their matchy-matchy receptor, okay? And if we use that, then we're gonna end up with two classes water-soluble hormones, and lipid-soluble hormones, all right? Whether a hormone is water-soluble or lipid-soluble absolutely determines how easily it can penetrate a plasma membrane. If it's a lipid-soluble hormone or chemical in general, then it's um, similar enough to the bi 
bilayer of phospholipids that comprises our plasma membranes, that it can easily penetrate plasma membrane. Whereas if it's water soluble, then it's kind of the principle of, of oil and water um, repel each other. The water soluble chemicals can't easily penetrate plasma membrane. And uh, that determines so many different factors for these different hormones. Water soluble horm hormones are the most common. <coughs> the most abundant okay so in other words if you were taking an assessment and I asked you whether a particular hormone was water soluble or lipid soluble and you just did not know the answer then the safer bet would be water soluble most hormones are water soluble okay water soluble hormones again they cannot cross a plasma membrane Okay, whereas lipid soluble hormones can and will quite easily. Okay, because water soluble hormones can't cross the plasma membrane, they have to bind to a receptor that is on the target cell. This represents the target cell here. This represents bloodstream, obviously. And this represents secreting organ or secreting cell okay and then lipid soluble hormones because they can cross the plasma membrane they will bind to a receptor that's inside the target cell that receptor despite this illustration it may be located or housed in the cytoplasm or it may be located or housed actually in the nucleus either way the hormone binds to the receptor and it's the hormone receptor complex that will actually act directly on dna so even if that receptor is is here in the cytoplasm once it binds to the hormone the hormone receptor complex will cross that nuclear envelope and act directly on dna okay whereas when water soluble hormones bind to their receptor, that complex isn't going anywhere. So we're gonna need all sorts of other friends along the way in order to get things done and actually influence what that cell is going to do, okay? So that's gonna be a really big theme here. Slide six, let's talk about water soluble hormones. Again, they have to bind to a receptor that is on the target cell and neither the hormone nor the hormone receptor complex will actually enter the cytoplasm of that target cell. So we're gonna need some friends. And here, rather silly looking, are depicted those friends, okay? Whenever our textbook shows us this relay race, okay, it's trying to communicate with us and say, hey, this mechanism is metabotropic. We need friends. We need uh, more steps. Okay. We need assistance. And the friends that we need obviously need to be on, in this case, on the inside of the target cell. Okay. And so that's what these different shapes and, and colors that the illustrator has included, that's what they, they represent. They're gonna be the sort of relay runners, okay? Well, water-soluble hormones, they will always utilize a G protein. And in fact, that's what this blue dude is, okay? That G protein is an, a, a, a protein that is associated with the plasma mem membrane, but it's not attached permanently to the plasma membrane. It is coupled with the receptor. So this, this super friend here, darker purple, but actually the illustrator made look like an R, which is adorable. That's our receptor. Gosh, that's cute. I never even noticed that. And then these guys, of course, are our, our, our hormone molecules, okay? 
the receptor is bound to the plasma membrane. In fact, it's a transmembrane protein, so it's uh, actually locked in there. The G protein is not. So the G protein can, can go along for a ride, and that's what these arrows are kind of depicting. And it looks like, wow, that's a big journey. But if we, if we realize that this is on a, a molecular scale, uh, this isn't very far to travel at all. But G proteins, yeah, they can kind of scoot along the inside surface of the plasma membrane, okay? And water-soluble hormones uh, typically utilize that G protein messenger that helper, that relay racer, in either the pathway that's called the cyclic AMP pathway or the pathway that's called the PIP2 calcium pathway. And I don't know why, but whenever I say PIP2 calcium, I typically end up saying PIP2 calcium. <laughs> so just, you know, be prepared. <laughs> All right, let's move to slide seven so that we can walk through what a typical cyclic AMP pathway looks like, okay? And uh, we'll actually need many slides in succession for this. Slide seven is just gonna start the pathway for us. So again, there's our hormone bound to a receptor, looks like an R, just stinking adorable. Okay, here's our G protein friend coupled with our receptor, but it's not permanently stuck or adhered to our receptor or to the plasma membrane, okay? Let's move to eight. The binding of that hormone changes the shape of the receptor, and the receptor therefore kind of gives a shove, um, or if, if, you were, if we were live in the classroom, I would throw my hip really hard. Uh, to that G protein, and the G protein goes for a little scoot. It gets displaced. Scoot, 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 okay? And it's this is a short trip, even though it looks ginormous at this scale, okay? In other words, this is just one phospholipid to give you a sense of the scale. All right, scoot, scoot, scoot. Moving on to slide number 10. And when that G pro protein scoots along, it eventually runs into another transmembrane protein, okay? And that transmembrane protein has uh, a shape, a receptor, a lock, okay, that fits with that excited G protein. <laughs> so they couple, excuse me. That transmembrane protein, in general, is called an effector enzyme. And there's an effector enzyme in both the cyclic AMP pathway and the PIP2 calcium pathway, okay? But specifically in the cyclic AMP pathway, that effector enzyme is adenylate cyclase, right? Moving on to slide number 11. Adenylate cyclase changes shape now that it's bound to that G protein and in turn kind of relays the energy of that, that shape change to ATP. And it converts ATP that's inside the target cell into AMP. ATP, hopefully you already know, stands for adenosine triphosphate. AMP stands for... That's right, adenosine monophosphate, okay? So we're gonna give up two phosphate groups. However, this is a cyclic AMP, uh, meaning that it's very easy. Uh, it just naturally will get converted back into ATP, so we can redo, 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 okay? Let's move to slide number 12. Cyclic AMP, in turn, will typically activate enzymes inside the cell, and in this case, it's a, a protein kinase, okay? And then that protein kinase goes on to elicit other responses in the cell, typically targeting DNA, right? Hey, make this protein. Hey, stop making this protein. Hey, do mitosis, so on and so forth, okay? Now, this particular um, 
illustration. It's a great illustration, but it's a little bit misleading. So let's go to slide 13, where I've taken the same, the same image and tesserized it just a little bit to drive home that, that really it just takes one hormone molecule binding to a receptor to elicit the conversion of many ATP molecules in the cyclic AMP and therefore the conversion of many inactive kinases enzymes into active enzymes. Okay, so one hormone molecule, it's, it, it, it can um, be amplified within the target cell. Okay. Cyclic AMP is very quickly, very readily degraded uh, back into ATP, and and therefore, um, or or its parts are available to make ATP. I guess I should say. Therefore, the this this response in the target cell doesn't doesn't continue forever. But that's really a theme of the whole body. That if enzymes or proteins are left exposed, then then um, they will they will be degraded. Let's go to slide 14, which looks really busy, but it's actually not, not quite as scary as, as you might think. Um, it's, it's just one slide really describing the entire PIP2 calcium pathway, okay? This time around, our, our effector enzyme is instead of adenylate cyclase, phospholipase C, phospholipase C, okay? But we still have our... Um, hormone, our receptor, our G protein, our effector enzyme, okay? So same gist, any G protein pathway will be the same gist, okay? But in this case, in this case, phospholipase C, when coupled with, um, oh, actually, I, I, I boxed the wrong thing here. I should be boxing that dude. Anywho, uh, phospholipase C, when it, it couples with that sort of excited G protein, it's going to split, temporarily, but split, into, um, oh gosh, I, I, miss, I misspoke that, in addition to boxing the wrong thing. So rewind, that's the rewind sound. Phospholipase C, when it couples with G protein, it will transfer that energy, if you will, that shape change into the cleavage of another molecule. And that other molecule is called PIP2, uh, hence the name of the, the pathway, okay? It splits PIP2 or cleaves PIP2 into two um, subunits. And each subunit goes on to do something different. And the two subunits have, have uh, horrible names. So most people just call them DAG and IP3, okay? DAG will go on to activate protein kinases. So it kind of acts like uh, cyclic AMP that we saw in, in um, the cyclic AMP pathway, okay? Whereas... IP3 triggers the release of calcium ions from internal or intracellular um, pantries or, or storage units. And I don't know about you, but instantly when I hear that calcium is being stored inside a cell and that uh, IP3 is triggering the release of that calcium from those intracellular stores into the cytoplasm, I immediately think smooth muscle. And sure enough, this is the mechanism, at least from the endocrine system standpoint, that would bring about the contraction of smooth muscle. And that's why there's a note on here that says, hey, for instance, that calcium can um, stimulate the binding of 
um, calmodulin, so the calmodulin, which is the, the calcium regulator or the calcium modulator in smooth muscle, shifts out of the way and allows actin and myosin to bind to each other and obviously contract. Okay, so whenever you think um, pip to calcium, it, it, smooth muscle is a nice target cell or target organ to think about, okay? Let's move on to slide 14. We were just talking about water-soluble hormones. Water-soluble hormones, they always use a G protein, okay? But they may use a G protein in the cyclic AMP pathway or they may use a G protein in the PIP2 calcium pathway. I will always specify for you whether a hormone is water soluble or lipid soluble whenever we, we meet a new hormone, okay? When I want you to know whether that water soluble hormone is um, utilizing the cyclic AMP pathway, I will specify. When I want you to know whether it's um, utilizing the PIP2 calcium pathway, I will specify. And if I don't care and therefore I'm not gonna ask you, I won't specify. All right. The good news is lipid soluble hormones, because they don't need those relay racers, because they don't need helpers on the inside of the cell, because they can uh, permeate that plasma membrane, they're much more straightforward and easier to understand. Okay. The, the bad news is that we have fewer lipid solu solid soluble nice hormones than we do water soluble hormones and this slide 14 is just reminding us hey lipid soluble hormones they bind within the target so in this case the illustrator gave us a receptor in the cytoplasm in general but be aware that that receptor could actually be inside the nucleus Okay, it's the receptor hormone complex, the binding, the combination of the two that actually acts directly on DNA. Fewer relay racers, fewer steps, okay, and that's a, a big deal that we'll make, make a point of later. Let's go to slide 15. Hopefully you would already infer that most hormones are regulated, or at least their release is regulated, their secretion is related, regulated by negative feedback. Because negative feedback is the most common feedback mechanism in the human body. Positive feedback is a little, uh, a little more rare, uh, but, but is relevant even in the endocrine system. And we'll come up with some examples of that as we go through really this whole quarter. Okay, but most are influenced by negative feedback. So once that that target cell um, brings about the desired effect, the effect uh, in turn inhibits the release or further release of more hormone. Okay, hormone release or secretion, same thing, can be triggered by a number of um, stimuli. And for that, I'd actually like to move to slide 17, okay? There are three main types of stimuli that can bring about the secretion of hormones. And unfortunately, some of them are very, very similar in spelling and um, pronunciation. <clears throat> A stimulus may be humoral, and humor just means fluid. Okay, like aqueous humor or vitreous humor in the eyeball, it, it fluid, okay? <coughs> but um, specifically bodily fluids. And in this particular content, or context, I should say, um, we're talking about contents of the blood, okay? So we could be talking about glucose, blood glucose. We could be talking about blood calcium levels, um, we could be talking about gas content, okay? Just something in the blood that's normally in the blood, but maybe the levels are, are outside homeostatic regular or homeostatic norm um, acts as the stimulus, okay? And then um, sort of skipping over that guy in the center, hormonal. Yes, a hormone can in turn stimulate the secretion of a hormone. <laughs> okay, so um, 
uh, an obvious example is the pituitary gland. And when I think of the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus, I imagine that the hypothalamus is the store owner, the big boss, the policy maker, okay? But the pituitary gland is the store manager. Who deals most directly with the minions, with the employees? The store manager. Okay, but who tells the store manager what to do? The store owner, all right? So um, one of the, the, the jobs of the hypothalamus is to boss around the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland, in turn, bosses around many other hormone producers, many other endocrine glands, okay? And whenever we have a hormone triggering the secretion of another hormone in a different organ, that hormone is said to be tropic, tropic, okay? Hypothalamic hormones, most of them are tropic. Pituitary hormones, most of them are tropic because they tell another endocrine organ to um, secrete its product, all right? Now, the dude in the middle here, the nervous system can also bring about the secretion of a hormone. And this example is actually hopefully age old, although I'm a little bit cranky that this, well, this is what we really want to emphasize. The sympathetic nervous system innervates the uh, adrenal, specifically medulla, the, the like core of the adrenal gland. The parasympathetic system does not. So this is one of those organs that's not dually innervated, okay? Which maybe you already know, or I at least hope you already knew that one. Um, when there are frequent action potentials along that sympathetic pathway, headed to the adrenal medulla, then in turn, the postganglionic neurons that make up that adrenal medulla, it's not shown, I'm sorry, um, they will release norepinephrine and epinephrine, okay? So um, nervous system bringing about the, the release of hormone, nervous system acting as stimulus. Humoral stimuli, neural stimuli, hormonal stimuli, right? I'm on slide 18, okay? We already made the point of, hey, a target cell has to have a specific or a matchy-matchy receptor um, in order for a hormone to bring about uh, a response. Okay, and that response is predetermined. So really the binding of a hormone, it acts more like a, a switch. It either uh, turns on or turns off. Uh, it flips the switch for yes mitosis, or it flips the switch for no mitosis, or it flips the switch for yes secrete, or it flips the switch for no synthesis, that sort of thing, okay? So in that case, hormones are, they're triggers. They don't really actually relay any information, but arguably neurotransmitters do the same thing. So hopefully that, that doesn't throw you for a loop. Activation of a target cell is influenced by a number of factors, including how much of a particular hormone is present in the bloodstream, how many receptors are available on that or in that target cell, and how strongly hormone and receptor bind, how high their affinity is for each other. If their affinity is weak and the receptor will just as easily bind some other molecule or mimic then that's low affinity. If the receptor will only ever bind with its matchy-matchy, highly specific hormone and bind well with that hormone, then affinity is high. Let's move to slide number 19.
Now, the amount of hormone, how much hormone is available in the bloodstream, can actually uh, act as a stimulus on the cell in general, the target cell in general, in terms of how many receptors it makes available, okay? Because receptors are just proteins. And the job of all of our cells, the specialty of all of our cells, is to make proteins. They're just protein factories. That's, that's what a cell is, okay? And our, our cells will make proteins. They will break down proteins depending on conditions, okay? In this case depending on how much hormone they're being exposed to, okay? So, for instance, oops, sorry, totally threw my pencil across the table. Uh, if the levels of a matchy-matchy hormone in, in the bloodstream are low, then the target cell will take that as a trigger to make and install more receptors. That's called upregulation. Okay? If, on the other hand, levels of a matchy matchy hormone are high, then the target cell will, will interpret that as a trigger to um, remove and degrade receptors. And that's called down regulation. Okay? Let's go to slide 20, which actually has a whole bunch of little tidbits on it. Hormones can circulate in the bloodstream, either free, which means unbound, not bound, or bound, carried, ferried. They need a carrier or a farrier protein. It's the lipid-soluble hormones that are bound in the bloodstream. And it's the water-soluble hormones that are not. And frankly, that just makes sense. If I have a hormone in the bloodstream that will readily cross plasma membranes, well, I don't actually want it to cross plasma membranes all willy-nilly, wherever it damn well pleases. I want it to cross plasma membranes wherever it's most relevant, okay? So lipid-soluble hormones, they're kind of kept under wraps until they get a little closer to their target cells or their target organ. They're held kind of uh, inert in the bloodstream so that they're not... Uh, attempting to exit the bloodstream sort of um, prematurely, okay? Whereas water-soluble hormones, they can't cross plasma membranes, so they don't need a farrier to help sort of regulate uh, when they exit the bloodstream, all right? So that's yet another uh, difference between lipid and water-soluble hormones, all right? The concentration or, or uh, really amount of a hormone in the bloodstream certainly reflects how much of it is being released and how quickly it's being released, but more so or, or also very important is how quickly it degrades, okay? Well, different hormones degrade at different speeds. Which hormones do you think are typically easier to degrade? Lipid soluble or water soluble? Well, who's exposed, whereas who's bound to a farrier and therefore not as exposed? Well, water soluble typically degrade faster. Hopefully that just makes sense. Lipid soluble, they stick around for a little longer. And that's also the point that's being made at the bottom of the slide, uh, the, the amount of time that it takes for our hormones uh, levels in the bloodstream to decrease by half is called its half-life. And water-soluble hormones have, on average, the shorter half-lives, okay? 
So another difference between lipid soluble and water soluble. So if we're making all these contrasts between lipid soluble and water soluble, then hopefully we smell a table, okay? Maybe on an assessment. By the way, if you're new to Tessa, Tessa loves tables, whether it's in an exam or uh, just a study tool. Let's move on to slide number 21. Different target cells will uh, exhibit different response times because some hormones will uh, elicit or provoke immediate responses. Some hormones, they take longer to elicit a response. Some hormones, uh, they stay inert or inactive um, until the target cell itself activates the hormone. So that, that could also influence how long the, the target cell takes to respond, okay? But, but typically, the, um, the response of a target cell, it's going to last anywhere from seconds to hours, all right? I'm on slide 22. We make oodles and oodles of hormones, and we make, we make oodles and oodles of types of hormones. Therefore, it shouldn't surprise you that we can have lots of hormones in our bloodstream simultaneously. Some hormones actually act on the same target cells. Okay, and uh, even though the, that target cell will have different receptors for each hormone, each, sorry, I paused and totally lost track of what I was saying. <laughs> I think I was saying something like each um, hormone will have its own, own specific matching, matching receptor, um, but a single cell could have receptors for multiple hormones and typically will. Okay, so whenever hormones have the same target cell, there's no guarantee that they actually bring about the same response, the same effect, okay? If a hormone binds to a cell and allows a second hormone to uh, have its effect on that Cell. So in other words, if one hormone acts as permission slip for a second hormone, then the relationship between those two hormones is said to be permissive, okay? For instance, thyroid hormone acts as a permission slip, if you will, for the, the sex hormones. If two hormones binding to the same target cell have the same effect, they, they bring about the same response, that, that response will actually be amplified because more than one hormone is, is binding, more than one molecule is binding. And therefore, the relationship between the, those two hormones is said to be synergistic, synergistic. If hormones have opposite effects on the same cell simultaneously, then their relationship is said to be antagonistic, antagonistic, okay? And antagonism is a tough one because um, some of the hormones that are, that are often described as antagonists are not actually true antagonists. And unfortunately, one of those misleading um, go-to examples is insulin and glucagon. Notice I just crossed it out. <laughs> okay. Um, a, a much better, straightforward, um, sort of uh, inarguable uh, antagonistic relationship exists between calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. Okay, they are true antagonists, and I'll, I'll come back to that argument when we actually meet those hormones. Speaking of which, if we go to slide 23, this is uh, an overview slide, obviously, that's just driving home for us that, that for 
all of the glands we're about to meet, for all of the hormones, specific hormones that we're about to meet, you are held responsible for knowing the name, full name of the hormone and its abbreviation. Okay? Unless I say otherwise, and I'll only say otherwise like twice, I think. So for instance, um, when you're studying, you're not going to just write PTH. You're going to laboriously write out, oh my God, make it stop. I hate this teacher so much, right? <laughs> Parathyroid hormone. Okay. For each hormone, you want to specify whether it's lipid-soluble or water-soluble. If it's water-soluble, you may need to specify whether it's cyclic AMP or it uses a cyclic AMP pathway um, or the PIP2 calcium pathway. And again, I'll specify whenever I care. You'll also need to be able to identify the organ, the endocrine gland, that produces the hormone versus the one that secretes or releases the hormone. Secrete and release are the same thing. Okay. Who the target organs are or target organ and what the response, the expected response of that, that target or those targets is or are. Okay. Now, the, the only thing on this slide that, that is very often confusing for students is the difference between production and secretion. Just because a particular cell makes a protein doesn't guarantee that that's the same cell that shares that protein with the bloodstream. Yes, usually most endocrine organs will produce and secrete. They're responsible for both production and secretion of their hormone or hormone products, okay? But there are some exceptions, and because of those exceptions, we'll need to specify where that hormone is being produced versus where that hormone is being secreted. And the chief exceptions will be the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. For instance, the hypothalamus makes a hormone that's called antidiuretic hormone, but it doesn't secrete antidiuretic hormone. It sends antidiuretic hormone really along the, the, the axon of a neuron into the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, and then the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland secretes antidiuretic hormone even though the pituitary gland doesn't make antidiuretic hormone, okay? So just be really careful about production versus secretion. Not always the same thing, okay? Oh, oh you can't see it here, but you should be able to see it on your, on your PowerPoint slide. Somebody came along and, and made a header for maybe a table that you might make. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. All right, moving on to slide number 24. Finally, we get to actually meet some endocrine organs and find out uh, what they make and what those different hormones do, okay? The hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is shown both in this photo and this illustration. I'm gonna outline it as best I can. Looks kinda like a bird beak. Okay. Here's hypothalamus in the illustration. Kind of like a bird beak. Okay. Especially if you see bird head and bird eye in the illustration. All right. The hypothalamus makes or produces, same thing, eight hormones. Or at least we're gonna we're gonna focus on eight hormones this quarter, okay? But it does not secrete all eight of those those hormones. And by secrete we mean into the bloodstream, share with the bloodstream, okay? The pituitary gland, which is not shown in the photo on this slide, but is depicted here.
Okay. And the illustration on this slide, it's shaped, yes, kind of like a scrotum. Okay. However, this is the lateral view. So it's a twisted and therefore uh, uncomfortable scrotum. Okay, we'll blow it up uh, on other slides as well. The reason why it looks almost like it has two um, well, testicles inside <laughs> is because the two lobes of the pituitary gland are not made out of the same tissue. The anterior lobe of the pituitary gland is made out of glandular epithelium, whereas the posterior lobe, and I've oriented the same way as the, as the illustration, uh, it is comprised of nervous tissue that actually um, evaginates, uh, extends downward during the development of uh the, the hypothalamus. So it's, it's kind of like an outcropping of the hypothalamus, which is comprised of nervous tissue. Okay. And so because there are two different tissues, uh, the two different lobes end up looking quite distinct from each other. Okay. There is only one pituitary gland though, and the stalk on which it's suspended from the hypothalamus is called the infundibulum. Infundibulum. We're going to focus on six hormones that the pituitary produces or makes. And we'll also make sure that we cover the hormones that it secretes. If the pituitary gland makes about six hormones but secretes about eight, hmm, who is making those extra two? That's right, the hypothalamus, okay? If you could do simple math, maybe you can figure out how many of the hypothalamic hormones are produced there but not secreted there. Well, what's the difference between eight and six? Two! Two of the hypothalamic hormones are produced in the hypothalamus but secreted by the pituitary gland. Okay, now another uh, endocrine organ that we find in the brain is the pineal gland. It is here on the illustration. Okay, and here on the photo. And it's actually called the pineal gland because it looks like a teeny tiny pine cone. All right, those are the three um, endocrine organs that we find in the brain. Let's move on to. Slide number 25. Slide 25 really blows up that pituitary gland, hypothalamus, infundibulum relationship for us, which is really nice. And here we're focused on specifically the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland and its relationship with the hypothalamus. Notice that we have cell bodies, so may of neurons in the hypothalamus. And if we trust this, this image or if we take it at face value, then apparently the hypothalamus only has four neurons that are housed within. No, silly, this is just a model. So it's oversimplified. There are, there are far, 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 far more neurons that are housed in the hypothalamus, okay? But here are just a few of them. Okay, some of these neurons, they make a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin, okay? Some of these hormones, they, I'm sorry, neurons, <laughs> they make a hormone called antidiuretic hormone, or ADH is the abbreviation. Oxytocin doesn't have, um, a very reliable or conventional abbreviation. So it's one of those exceptions where you don't need to know the exception. I mean, the uh, abbreviation. Yeah. Anywho, this hormone, whether it's oxytocin or antidiuretic hormone, it travels down the axon of the, the same neuron, but that axon is housed in the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, and the axon terminals of those neurons 
are absolutely located in the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And so when these uh, hormones or neurohormones are secreted, released, shared with the bloodstream, they are shared in specifically the location, the address of the posterior pituitary gland. Okay, so this is one of those cases where, or two of those cases really, where production and secretion are not happening in the same place. All right, where is oxytocin produced? The hypothalamus, where is it secreted? The posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Where is antidiuretic hormone produced? hypothalamus, where is it secreted? Posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So hopefully, even though that's weird, it's clear. Let's talk about oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. Oxytocin is a water-soluble hormone, and on each hormone side where I want you to know water-soluble or lipid-soluble, I'll give you a code, W or L. Okay, and whenever I will hold you responsible for the water-soluble pathway, I'll specify. You do need to know that oxytocin utilizes the PIP2 calcium pathway or signaling pathway, okay? Oxytocin between neurons acts as a neurotransmitter, but of course, if it's released into the bloodstream, hormone, that was a snap, just in case it doesn't actually sound like that. Okay, well, when you think PIP2 calcium, what do you think of? You think smooth muscle, right? So, no wonder. Oh, oxytocin triggers or targets the smooth muscle of the uterus as well as the smooth muscle associated with mammary glands. Okay. Oxytocin triggers contraction of the uterus uh, during labor and delivery and triggers the ejection or letdown of milk, but not the production. That's not the same thing. Hey, memory glands, go ahead and release that milk. Not, hey, memory glands, go ahead and produce that milk. This is one of those weird exceptions as hormones go uh, in that both of these responses by target cells are uh, under positive, the influence of positive feedback. We want oxytocin um, levels to increase and thin out the cervix. And as the cervix thins out more, we want more oxytocin to be released and therefore thin out the cervix more. And as the cervix thins out more, we want more oxytocin to be released. It's a snowball. Same thing with milk let down. Once we're making milk, we want to keep making it and make more of it because the kid's growing, right? Let's look at slide 27, which covers the antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is also water soluble, okay? And uh, in the hypothalamus, um, well, really, we can argue that the hypothalamus has lots and lots and lots and lots of jobs. And hopefully, you covered, uh, at least as an overview, the many functions or roles of the hypothalamus in 241. But um, some of what the hypothalamus is concerned with is monitoring um, what's going on in the body, uh, especially what's going on in the bloodstream, okay? And uh, one of the things it's monitoring, uh oh, dog is wiggling, sorry. <laughs> um, one of the things that it's monitoring is um, the solute concentrations in the bloodstream, okay? And in that, in that sense, the sensory receptors, not to be confused with cellular receptors, that the hypothalamus is housing and utilizing are osmol receptors, okay? If that solute concentration is too high, in other words, uh, above a homeostatic norm, then the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland is triggered to go ahead and secrete antidiuretic hormone. Where is antidiuretic hormone made? Hypothalamus. Where is it secreted? Posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, okay? 
and antidiuretic hormone targets the kidneys. Let me see if I can uh, I'll squeeze in some space here. Kidney tubules. Let's talk about that uh, as at least a preview. So I'm drawing what ends up kind of looking like a snake. A cutesy snake. And by drawing, I mean trying to draw. Pretending to draw. Oh boy, that's bad. Extra bad. Preview nephrons even in 241. I think um, a lot of the tissues make better sense if you know what the heck you're, you're considering. If you can see the big picture, in other words. Okay, so here's the snake. It looks kind of like a python dripping off of a branch. And obviously, this portion is the head of the snake. <laughs> okay, whereas uh, the the remainder is like the the body of the snake okay right this snake is obviously not a snake and it's actually microscopic it's a kidney tubule or a nephron nephron okay come on there we go well the body of the snake is called the renal, which just means kidney. It's like the fancy, fancy descriptor that means kidney. Renal tubule. Okay. I'm going to change colors because I need to add something in here. Arterial, uh, which means small artery. Okay. Ball of yarn, really a ball of capillaries. And arterial. All right, so now the snake has a ball of yarn in its mouth. The snake's head and the ball of yarn are called the renal corpuscle. Okay, and the job of the renal corpuscle is to filter almost everything out of the blood, whereas the job of the renal tubule, well, there are actually two. Let me get this word in here first. Is to make adjustments in that fluid that's removed. And the fluid that's removed is called filtrate, okay? The renal tubule will reabsorb quite a bit reclaim, in other words, from the filtrate, but also secrete some of the more stubborn blood-borne substances into filtrate. All right, so a lot of that nephron is concerned with adjusting filtrate. All of the filtrate from separate nephrons are getting is getting combined, right? Ultimately to form urine, okay? Well, antidiuretic hormone says, hey, nephrons, when you are reabsorbing 
when you're deciding what to reclaim or what to keep inside the body from filtrate, make sure you reabsorb more water. Well, if nephrons reabsorb more water, if we keep more water, then that means what happens to urine volume? Does urine volume increase or decrease? That's right, urine volume decreases because we're keeping blood volume high, okay? Now, just FYI, the secretion of antidiuretic hormone is also triggered by uh, certain stressors, low blood pressure, pain, certain drugs, uh, but it's inhibited by alcohol, which is um, one of the reasons why we, we get dehydrated uh, when we um, over enjoy. <laughs> Let's move to slide 28. You've probably heard of diabetes mellitus before. In fact, uh, when we talk about diabetes, typically we're talking about diabetes mellitus. And there are two types of diabetes mellitus. Ooh, is it IS or US? Boy, it looks funny when I write US. I think that's how it's spelled. Them. Anywho, um, there are two types of diabetes mellitus, but there are three types of diabetes in general. And the third type is diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is uh, a deficiency in antidiuretic hormone, um, or another way to, to, to word that. What does the prefix hypo mean? Under or below. Diabetes insipidus is due to hyposecretion of ADH antidiuretic hormone, okay? Usually because the hypothalamus is damaged, the pituitary gland is damaged, or both, okay? Or, or at least the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland is, is damaged, okay? And it's characterized by some of the same uh, symptoms that we observe in diabetes mellitus. Um, intense thirst, and, and we'll, we'll find out a fancy word for that later and uh, increased urine output, okay? And because urine output is so high, blood volume is being depleted fairly continuously, and that's why the hypothalamus is saying, drink, 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 drink. A patient with diabetes insipidus must stay well hydrated or their body will automatically um, really put them in, in danger, okay? Let's move to Slide number 29. The remaining six hypothalamic hormones are tropic. And recall that, that tropic hormones are hormones that, that target other endocrine organs. All right, endocrine organ influencing uh, another endocrine organ. All right, and they are growth hormone releasing hormone. Nope, not kidding. Growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Thyrotropin releasing hormone, corticotropin releasing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, and prolactin inhibiting hormone. Okay, and their corresponding abbreviations are shown. Notice that all of these tropic hormones are water soluble. Well, what about oxytocin? Is oxytocin water soluble or lipid soluble? Oh. It's also water soluble. What about antidiuretic hormone? Water soluble or lipid soluble? Oh, it's also water soluble. Oh, all eight of the hypothalamic hormones are water soluble. That's kind of nice that they all fall into the same class. Okay. Well, these six tropic hypothalamic hormones, they're all going to target not just the pituitary gland, but the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, okay? So let's look at these a little bit. Uh, slide 30, same image, almost, okay? But this time around, we're looking at the relationship between the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. 
recall that the hypothalamus is comprised of nervous tissue. All right. And yes, so is the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. But the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland is comprised of glandular epithelium. So they're not the same kind of tissue. Therefore, we do need a blood system link between hypothalamus and anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, even though they're so close together. And that link is called the hypophysial portal system. Hypophysial portal system. Now, personally, I have never asked students about the different aspects of the portal system. I'm impressed if they know that the portal system is there to convey hormones from hypothalamus to target cells in the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Okay? Well, in response to the hypothalamic tropic hormones, the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland may secrete a hormone called growth hormone, a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone, not to be confused, but so very easily confused with thyrotropin releasing hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, nope, not kidding, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, prolactin, not to be confused with prolactin inhibiting hormone, okay? So again, the blood system link, although it's the shortest link ever, <coughs> excuse me, between the hypothalamus and the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland is the hypophysial, hypophysis means pituitary, portal system. Let's look at slide 31. So again, the um, products of the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland are growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and prolactin, and their abbreviations are shown alongside, okay? Many of these are tropic, okay? All except for growth hormone and prolactin are tropic, all right? And all of these except growth hormone operate via the cyclic AMP signaling pathway. If growth hormone doesn't operate via the cyclic AMP pathway and it's water soluble, then which pathway does it utilize? Ah, PIP2. That's the weirdest calcium I've ever written in my life. All of these hormones are water soluble. Yay, that's kind of nice. All water soluble. Be aware that growth hormone has another name, somatotropin. Somatotropin. Which is a little misleading because it suggests that it's tropic. All right, if we go to slide 31, this slide highlights growth hormone. Not growth hormone, releasing hormone, not growth hormone, inhibiting hormone, but growth hormone, the product of the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, okay? Growth hormone is a really busy hormone. It has a lot of targets. It technically targets all cells because it influences their metabolism. Really, the best way to influence body-wide metabolism is to influence as many cells as possible, okay? But it also brings about additional, additional responses in the liver, in skeletal muscles, and in bone, okay? We'll come back to that. Where metabolism is concerned, growth hormone says, hey cells, when you're choosing which fuel to utilize, when you're choosing which fuel to utilize, really downplay utilization of glucose 
and instead turn to fatty acids as your fuel source. Okay? Growth hormone also says, hey cells, go ahead and synthesize proteins. Get busy synthesizing your products, your protein products. Okay? But at the same time, growth hormone is saying, don't take up glucose, don't use glucose as a fuel. At the same time, it's saying, hey, liver, thank you, liver, for doing so many jobs for us since one of the jobs that you do is to store glucose in the form of glycogen. Please convert that glycogen into back into glucose and release that glucose into the blood. All right? And all in all, all of these metabolic responses they're really in place to bring blood glucose levels up to homeostatic norm, okay? Don't deplete blood glucose and in fact increase how much blood glucose is present uh, liver, okay? In the meantime, Growth hormone is also telling the liver, skeletal muscles, and bone to produce and secrete insulin-like growth factors. There's a nice mouthful. Insulin-like growth factors, okay? Insulin-like growth factors in turn tell the cells of the body to uptake the different ingredients, the different building blocks necessary to synthesize DNA and prepare for cell division, all right? And they also communicate with bone to say, hey, bone, please practice deposition. Please emphasize deposition rather than resorption, okay? Well, when I think of, wow, more collagen, wow, more cell division, and wow, this is called growth hormone, these things make me think, oh, growth hormone gets me ready to grow. If I'm getting ready to grow, then why take all these metabolic efforts to increase blood glucose to homeostatic norms? Because growth is expensive. Okay, that's an interesting one, I, lo I like that one. Let's go to slide 33. This is um, kind of like a, what, a flow chart, right? To, to emphasize what growth hormone does. Personally, I, I usually love these guys. This one I'm not crazy about. I, I guess I would have organized it differently, but if it works for your brain, do it, please. Sounds good. Let's go to slide 34 and talk about thyroid stimulating hormone, another product of the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Water soluble or lipid soluble? That's right, water soluble. Really, all of the hormones made by the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland are water soluble. Okay? Well, thyroid stimulating hormone, not surprisingly, stimulates the thyroid. <laughs> Okay, it says, hey, thyroid, do your business. And we'll find out what that business is, of course. Okay, well, thyroid stimulating hormone, not surprisingly, is under um, negative, the control of negative feedback. So once our thyroid gland is, is secreting uh, enough of its products into the bloodstream, in other words, uh, once it's, it's been active long enough, that increase in thyroid hormone levels in the bloodstream feeds back to both the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland to say, hey, no more TSH, as well as feeding back to the hypothalamus to say, hey, hypothalamus, no more thyrotropin-releasing hormone. 
thyrotropin releasing hormone tells the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland to release, produce and release or secrete a thyroid stimulating hormone, which in, in turn tells the thyroid gland, hey, make your stuff too. Okay, so once thyroid gland makes enough of, of its stuff, those thyroid hormones are going to feed back and say, hey, turn off the faucet. Okay, negative feedback. Let's go to slide 34. Slide 34. Adrenocorticotropin or adrenocorticotropic hormone. Uh, is obviously a product of the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland because that's where we are right now, okay? It is released in response to the hypothalamic hormone, corticotropin-releasing hormone, okay, CRH. And adrenocorticotropin or tropic hormone, it targets specifically the adrenal cortex, okay? The adrenal gland has two major regions, Okay, the, the outermost region, which isn't, I wouldn't say isn't one of the functional regions of the adrenal gland, that's just the fibrous capsule, all right? Whereas this region here, kind of the rind of the fruit, if you will, that's the cortex, and this region here, the pulp of the fruit, the, the meat, if you will, is adrenal medulla, okay? And ACTH, adrenal corticotropic uh, hormone, it targets only the cortex of the adrenal gland. However, it targets the entire cortex, the entire cortex. That means that the different cells that are in the cortex of the adrenal gland will all be simultaneously stimulated, okay? And their products are collectively or generally called corticosteroids, corticosteroids. And we'll talk in detail about corticosteroids, but some of the corticosteroids that, that you've maybe heard of before include cortisol, Aldosterone, and believe it or not, sex hormones, just not gonadal sex hormones, okay? Corticosteroids, they're a whole class, they're a whole group of hormones, far more than three. I've just given you three examples. Um, all, all made by the adrenal cortex. If we stimulate the entire adrenal cortex, then we're saying, hey, make everything. Make everything, okay? Make all of your products, all right? And there is a daily rhythm associated with ACTH, and therefore also the, the production and release of corticosteroids. And the, the peak tends to be in the morning when we rise. And that tends to kind of, kind of uh, uh, peter out throughout the day. Okay. Um, we release corticotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, um, certainly in response to the, the need for these hormones. So uh, there are certainly um, uh, normal uh, stimuli that would favor the release of corticotropic releasing hormone, but we also will release it if we're suffering from fever, hypoglycemia, and stressors. Really? Stressors? I don't know about you, but when I think of stress, I think zombie apocalypse, I think COVID-19, and I think college student. <laughs> okay, so chances are your bloodstream has relatively high levels <laughs> of corticosteroids, ACTH, and CRH because you've got at least <laughs> a few of those stressors going on. Let's look at slide 35. 
Now, the bad news is that in this chapter, and, and unfortunately some others as well, there are just too many damn things to start with uh, the, the letter G. Okay. Gonadotropins and gonadal hormones are not the same thing. I'm sorry. Gonadal hormones are hormones that are actually made by the gonads, whereas gonadotropins are made, of course, by the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, okay? And the gonadotropins, there are two of them, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, okay? So if we look at uh, the list of hypothalamic hormones, again, notice that one of them is gonadotropin-releasing hormone, capital G, lowercase n, capital R, capital H, okay? Gonadotropin-releasing hormone produced and secreted by the hypothalamus tells the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland to secrete both both follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone okay gonadotropins we're not going to find in significant uh, number or concentrations in the blood until adolescence okay once we hit puberty then we'll have a, a fairly steady level of uh, gonadotropins. And the reason why I say fairly steady is because, uh, of course, we have cycles, all right? Um, Follicle-stimulating hormone specifically stimulates the production of gametes. And again, the gametes are ova in females and sperm in males, okay? Whereas luteinizing hormone tells the same targets. Who are those targets? Gonads. Okay? Tells the same targets. Hey, make your hormones. Follicle stimulating hormone, hey, make your cells. Luteinizing hormone, hey, make your hormones. Okay? In females, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone help to regulate the um, ovarian cycle, okay? In males, luteinizing hormone simply promotes the production of testosterone. Now be careful, uh, females produce testosterone as well, just not as much, okay? Moving on to slide 36, prolactin uh, product of the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, okay? It stimulates milk production, milk production, obviously, in females, okay? Prolactin is made by males, but it obviously doesn't bring about the, the production of, of milk. So um, its role, if it has any, it might just be going along for the genetic ride. But if it does have any role, it's, it's not understood or not well understood, okay? So milk production promotes or promoted by prolactin, whereas milk letdown promoted by oxytocin. So be careful not to confuse this guy with oxytocin. Okay. Well, prolactin is under the influence of a tropic hormone from the hypothalamus called prolactin inhibiting hormone. We don't actually have a prolactin releasing hormone. So it's kind of an either on or off. If prolactin inhibiting hormone secretion decreases, then that allows prolactin secretion to increase. And that's actually why um, many women, right before they, their period, they will suffer breast tenderness. It's because their, their mammary glands are getting ready to make milk, okay? They're just not given enough time to make milk. And that's because of a surge, just a short surge in prolactin, all right? Oh, there is no official slide. 37. That's kind of weird. I feel like I missed something. Go 
well, that's okay with me. All right. <laughs> there are our hypothalamic and pituitary hormones.